the size of the deep web is believed to be anywhere between 1,000 and two times greater than what we can find on the surface web. Indeed, there are believed to be in excess of 550 billion individual documents on the deep web, compared to a mere 1 billion on the web that we encounter on a daily basis. What's more, 95% of the deep web is easily accessible to you and I, meaning no fees or subscriptions. All we need is a keen interest to delve a little bit deeper. Of course, this makes for fertile ground for stories of intrigue, mystery, murder, and horror. But remember, my dear friends, these are just stories. I'm delighted to be joined today by Nathan Juice TV, who has contributed several stories to this compilation. Please do me a favor, check out his channel, give him a listen. Okay, no further delay. Sit back and relax with your favorite drink, my friends. It's time to listen. Part 1 I'm not a very technological person and I'm definitely not very skilled with computers. However, I did dedicate about two hours to try and download Tor, using as many YouTube tutorials as I could get my hands on. I wasn't interested in deep web surfing, or trying to find anything sick or perverted. I just wanted to get my hands on some drugs as soon as possible. I was a pretty big junkie, trying to get my hands on whatever I could. Oxycodone and meth were my personal favourite. Not only did I need to satisfy my own substance craving, I needed to fill in the money pit I'd fallen into. Getting wasted at my local bar every night while working a minimum wage job consumes a large part of my weekly paycheck. The only fast and easy income I knew I could get was through selling drugs, and most people I talked to recommended the deep web to me. I didn't really know what it was at first, so I did my research and read a lot of stories. I was nervous, but knew most of the nasty crap wasn't true, and that I wouldn't see it as long as I wasn't looking for it. That is, unless it would find me. So I booted Tor and went straight to the hidden wiki and started looking at the different drug marketplaces, and I must say, I was impressed. Some had sections for all different substances, while other sites focused on providing specific drugs, like marijuana or psychedelics. I found one marketplace that was selling both oxy and meth, and I decided to stay on this site for longer. For about ten minutes, I browsed the whole marketplace, but I was more interested in their oxy and meth, obviously. After converting currencies... I realized I could make a decent profit reselling this if I bought from this website. Remembering the name of it, I was all set to log out and go on with my day. I slid my cursor over to the red dot to close the window, when suddenly a new one popped up. It was small and almost blank, except for one line. Are you sure you want to leave just yet, sir? I wouldn't say this was jaw-dropping, but it was definitely a surprise to me. Two parts of this sentence came off as being strange, almost like he was standing over my shoulder. How did he know I was male? And how did he know I was about to leave? Nervously, I responded. Sadly, I have a few decisions to make before I buy anything. Well, don't take too long. We like people that come back, Colin. Seeing them type my name was enough to get me to shut down my computer and not turn it back on for another week. The only issue is that I didn't choose to go back voluntarily. About a week following this weird incident... 
I'd just gotten off of work and was pretty happy. Sitting behind a cash register all day made me hate people. I just wanted to get home and relax. Maybe pop an oxy or two while I'm at it. On the train ride home, my phone buzzed in my pocket. Now, friends were very limited, and I was not very close with my family, so I don't usually get texts, especially this time of day. Pulling out my ancient iPhone, the 3GS to be exact, I didn't recognize the number at all. It wasn't my area code. I surely realized who this was quickly once I read the message that made me gasp. Hey, I took you to be a man of your word. I believed you when you said you would come back. It's been a week, and I haven't seen your IP log onto the site. What gives? At the next stop, about three before my stop, my phone found a new home on the train tracks after it was violently smashed into a steel handle. Being paranoid the rest of the trip home, I cautiously entered my apartment building and approached my door to find a new phone and a note on the door. It simply said, We all get second chances. Make the right choice. Don't call the police. Not knowing what to do anymore, I simply complied with the note. Throughout the night, the thought of revisiting the marketplace to end this became all too real. There seemed like no other option, really. The person knew who I was, had my information, and didn't have any difficulty finding me wherever I went. Around 11 o'clock, I finally turned on my computer and loaded Tor, for the first time since this person had started talking to me. I went onto the marketplace and bought the two substances I was going to buy in the first place. Oxycodone and meth. I figured these guys were good at hiding their shit, but I had it shipped under a fake name to a house about four blocks away that I knew was abandoned. It was boarded up, not well kept, and had a no trespassing sign on the front door. Once I figured out how to set up a Bitcoin account and convert currency, I made my payment. I waited a little while longer for this person to say something to me, but they said nothing. <laughs> I thought I was in the clear. I followed this guy's instructions, bought his products. Hey, and have a nice day. Seems like a logical business deal, right? No. It's been about two weeks since I placed my order now. The package got dropped off at the abandoned house in about two days. Some of it was sold to cover my ass financially. Some I use myself because, well, that's what addicts do. But the thing I'd feared most of all has now happened. Today, once I got home from work, I had two messages from the same number as before. The first message read, Looks like you enjoyed my product. Now you have a reason to come back. I'll be expecting you, so don't keep me waiting. The second message was a collage of pictures. Of me. One of me holding the box the drugs were shipped in. One of me at work. One of me sleeping. One of me that looked like... It came directly from my webcam, like when I was buying his shit. Now, I'm borderline ready to call the police, but at the same time, I don't want to have some lunatic after me. I think I'll make him wait to test his patience. I'll keep you updated. Part 2 Alright. There's a lot to fill you in on. I don't think anyone can see me in here, but I won't stay too long, in case he realizes that he doesn't have his eyes on me. Sure enough, he noticed that I was blatantly ignoring the warning he'd issued me on my last update. So, it's a definite that either himself or someone else is watching me. 
let me tell you, this is one impatient motherfucker. I'm not even out of drugs yet. I've got enough oxy left for myself, and I made a good chunk of cash off that meth. Which I still have a little bit left of. Look, after I finally decided to go and buy this guy's products, I was only intending to do it once. Buy a lot of drugs at once, make money off them, and keep some for myself. He makes a profit, I make a profit, and we both have a happy ending. But, as usual, things just don't want to go my way. Anyways, once I saw the message in the pictures that were at the end of my last update, I decided to get the hell out of my house. I didn't want to be alone and be so easy to be singled out, so I walked about six or seven blocks to the bar I typically drink at. It was a small place that mostly locals went to after work. There were probably no more than 20 people in the place, but it was like a second home to me. Coming here for the first time in about a week wasn't to get pissed drunk or blow off some steam. I wanted to see how far this guy would go. I thought he was crazy already after forcing me to buy drugs off the deep web. But how badly does he need me as a customer? I'm sure there's plenty of college kids ordering off this guy on the daily. Anyways, around ten, I was still in the bar, working down another beer, when I noticed someone walking in, as did most of the other guys in the bar. A young lady, no older than 25, skinny, blonde, and rather tall, with a stunning body, came up next to me to order a drink. The idea struck me, and it was a long shot, but I thought about bringing her home. Obviously, I didn't know if she'd leave with a guy like me, but hey, anything was possible. So I turned to her, and we hit it off really well. We talked and did a few shots in between, and by midnight, she said yes to coming back home with me. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, yet. We got back and got down to business. Now, I've never been one to brag about my sexual experiences, if you're that curious, then <laughs> use your imagination. After we finished, we just lied there in my bed. She seemed like she was asleep, and I was pretty happy, so I decided not to wake her up and let her stay the night. May, I should have woken her up, but I hadn't had company in quite a while. I think it was around three when I woke up to find the girl absent from her spot next to me in bed. I figured she'd gotten up to go to the bathroom or something, but it was pretty clear that another person was in my kitchen. Confused and still half asleep, I walked to my bedroom door and looked down the hallway to see not one, but two people in my kitchen. Thank God they had their backs to me, or they would have noticed me. The kitchen light was dimly lit, making it hard to see. But the girl was talking to a man. He may have been shorter than the girl, but this didn't make him a small guy. I could see his shirt wrap around his arm muscles and show off his arm contours. His hair was a greasy black with some grey here and there, probably in his forties. Hearing them clearly talk about me and uh, how much, I had left of the oxy and meth I ordered last week. I assumed this was the guy who was sending me the messages. Why else would he be here? Not knowing what else to do, I quickly backed into my room and quietly opened my dresser. Now, I kept a decent sized machete under my clothes in the bottom drawer, in case someone ever broke in. Grasping it in one hand, I entered the kitchen. What the fuck is going on here? I exclaimed as the two individuals laid eyes on me. A slight grin spread onto the man's face. Well, it's a pleasure to finally meet you, Colin. 
Are you the creep that's been stalking me? He laughed. <laughs> I'm just a businessman looking to secure customers. Sometimes risks have to be taken. At this point, I wanted them both out of my house and out of my life. Forever. Why are you here? I bought your drugs. Lots of them. Just let me move on with my life. See, it's not that simple. My customers always come back to me. And I'll do what it takes to keep it that way. Now, you have a few choices. We will promptly make sure you purchase from me again and continue to do so. As long as you regularly do, you won't see my face ever again. Your second option involves running out this door to the police, telling them everything you know. Most likely being held in the cell for purchasing illegal substances. And you'll see me again when I'm placed in a cell with you. <laughs> You've got better odds at living by dealing with option one. The floor is yours. Trying to process everything this fucking freak just told me. I made a break for the door. I burst out the door, threw my machete, and just ran. I ran past the bar, not thinking about stopping by. My initial thought was just to run to the police. <laughs> this guy's just bluffing. There's no way I can get fucked in this situation. He forced me to do all that stuff, and he's been stalking me. But the farther I ran, the harder I thought. The thought of being arrested hit me hard. I hadn't been arrested since I was 19, when I got caught smoking pot in the back of my car. I slowed down and calmly entered a 24-hour convenience store. I started writing this once I got into the bathroom. I don't know if I should just play it safe and tell the police, or risk it all and play this guy's game. I don't know. I just don't know. Part 3 I've been taking into consideration some suggestions made by others to me, especially the one saying that I play this guy's game and win. Well, I've always had it in me to be eager to take on adventures. Ever since I was a teenager in high school, I was doing lots of stupid but thrilling stuff. So, congrats to those who told me to steer from law enforcement and play his game, because I decided I had nothing to lose in that bathroom stall. After an hour of hiding out and thinking, I unlocked my phone, found the mysterious number that was messaging me, and I called it. No answer. I called the number about four more times to the same response. Confused, I just decided to head back to my apartment to see if the guy was still there. After an exhausting walk back, I arrived back at the front of my apartment building. The sun had just barely broken above the horizon. I unlocked the front door. Ah, it appears that the italic text above is about as far as our good friend Colin got with his little adventures. Whether you like it or not, I'll finish the series for him and explain why his situation led to the current result. Colin was a nobody in life. I had never personally met him until he approached me with the machete he described in an earlier update of this. He may appear to be a confident individual that wasn't afraid to take risks in life, but, in reality, he was no braver than a young teenage girl entering a haunted house. The second he was forced to his knees, he begged. He begged and pleaded and screamed and cried like a teenage girl. His balls were like eggs, a shell hiding the soft center. It wasn't even a hard shell either. This guy broke down faster than anyone else who had betrayed me. Colin didn't care about anyone else in life but himself. He 
was a parasite. He had spent his life using people to better his own life and decrease the quality of life for others. Money, substances, sexual activity and pride were his main motives. He would secretly steal his parents' credit and debit cards, using them to buy whatever made him happy, and was smart enough to get away with it. He never had a steady relationship, probably because all he saw in any woman was sex, 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 and more sex. He had no friends. They all realized how manipulative this man was, and they all deserted him. Colin was kicked out of college for a sexual assault accusation, which the file showed to be pretty believable to say the least. He was useless in life. He contributed nothing to society. He used valuable resources that could have been used by more useful and more intelligent individuals that want to better the world and their own community. He was a waste of life. The only reason why I even bothered to involve myself into his life was because he indirectly begged me to. When he first browsed my marketplace, looking for whatever substances he was looking to buy, I was able to spend quite a bit of time researching Colin, and realizing that this man was a waste of space. I did what I could to get into his head and involve myself in his life, so I could perform more research. Once I knew enough about this man, I decided to proceed and put the target on his back. I'll now explain the rest of the story that Colin was, unfortunately, unable to finish. So, as you can tell, Colin didn't call the police. I knew exactly where he was. I knew he wasn't going to call the police or tell anyone about his situation. At this point, he was so messed up in the head by the entire situation that he believed it was his duty to win. He came back to his apartment hours after we'd already left. I knew he was going to try and kill me too. He spent the next few days preparing to do it, thinking I wouldn't notice the transactions on his credit card. He <laughs> fell into a trap, to say the very least. He thought it was as simple as inviting me into an empty apartment and blowing my brains out from exactly 216 yards away. That's the exact distance this idiot was from his apartment. The simplicity of my plan was too great, to be honest with you. $500 could get anyone to walk into this guy's apartment. And one unlucky soul did. He wandered into Colin's apartment unaware he was about to be shot dead in cold blood. The poor fellow didn't even see it coming. Boom! A bullet broke through the second-story window, piercing the man's heart and killing him instantly. He had literally set himself up. He walked over to his apartment and, by the time he realized that it wasn't me, the police were already up the stairs. So, Colin is going to rot in a maximum security jail cell for the rest of his life. Well, until he hangs himself or gets a shank to the neck. So, that's the end to this series. Sorry if it's not the ending that you expected or wanted. But hey, you get what you get. The deep web is one of the most amazing things on earth. Not because of how joyful it can make people or anything like that, but because it's a completely uncensored view of people. You can speak your mind, you can buy what you want, you can do anything you want when on the deep web. 
you can have complete and total freedom. Now, I've always been fascinated by the deep web. And at the time the events in the story occurred, I was in college. Lots of people at my campus had really been getting into accessing the deep web. It was almost like a trend. With so many people getting on it, it seemed perfectly safe for me to give it a try. Now, I've always heard of the deep web horror stories. Stories of hacking, stumbling on disgusting sites. These stories were mainly what kept me off the deep web. But with most of the people at my college using it on a normal basis, I decided to give it a go. I asked a friend to come over and help me set it up. When my friend arrived, we opened up my laptop and began to set everything up. He told me that we were going to be using Tor, a program that lets you access the deep web. He also asked me if I was planning on doing anything illegal, to which I replied no. He said that since I wasn't, we didn't need to install something called Tails which is apparently some kind of software that makes it more secure if you plan on doing illegal things. A little while later, everything was set up. I had my new IP address, and my friend gave me a brief rundown of what to do and what not to do. He made it very clear that when I was using the hidden wiki, that I kept it on censored mode, so that it would be less likely for me to see something I didn't want to see. After about two weeks of using the deep web, you know, I felt like a pro. I'd accessed so many different sites, spoken with some great people, made friends, even bought some weed. I'd become a little bit cocky and was ready to dig deeper into the dark web. I turned off the censored mode on the hidden wiki and began to browse the links. It took a while, mostly because Tor is a bit slow, and many of the links just lead to dead web pages. Eventually though, I stumbled onto a site called All The Gore. It was mainly a big chat room, with many different topics. I had a fairly strong stomach. I'd seen many violent movies, I've seen things like beheadings, killings, you know. After looking at a few different chat rooms, I noticed how sick this site really was. The people in these chat rooms were actual killers, bragging about some of the things they had done. You could also post pictures, and one man by the name of Culture045, he was explaining in detail how he'd broken into someone's house, kidnapped a little girl, and brutally killed her parents by hiding there under the bed, and then opening their throats. He then explained how he brought the little girl back to his house and did unspeakable things to her. Beat her, cut her up and, well, just some other things you don't even want to know. I didn't think he was telling the truth at first, but then he posted pictures. These were the most horrifying pictures I had ever seen. Close-ups of a poor I don't know, 8 or 10 year old girl being brutally beaten and cut with a knife. Culture kept posting these pictures. The new ones were of the girl tied to a chair, bleeding, crying, throwing up. Then he showed a picture of him with a drill. And he was drilling it into her skull. The most haunting part is that while he was doing it, he was looking at the camera with sheer joy on his face. Now, I'd seen enough, and I typed in the chat room. You people are sick. You deserve to die. How can you sleep at night? Immediately, people began making fun of me, saying that I was just as helpless and ignorant as the little girl in the pictures, and I should get off the big boy part of the internet. They began saying I was a pussy and then Culture045 started to type something in the chat room. He said, Really? Where do you live, buddy? I'm sure everybody would love to see you on this site. I then made the biggest mistake of my life and I typed, I'm calling the police and having this site shut down. Less than a minute later, 
everything on the site went black. And a new chat box appeared in green. In it, someone named Admin1 typed in the box. He said, Call the cops, and you will regret it. I didn't type anything in the box, and reached out for my cell phone. What happened next still haunts me to this day. My phone said I had one new message. I opened it, and it said, Call the police, and you are dead. There was no number. It didn't even say unknown number. It was just blank. I looked back at my laptop and saw my webcam light turn on. I quickly covered it, but I saw on the screen a picture of me looking at my phone. I got wide-eyed and froze for a moment. When the admin typed again, Put the phone down, right now, and uncover your webcam. I put my phone down, but kept the webcam covered when he typed again. Okay then, be like that. Right after, he posted my full name, age, and address in the chat box and typed, It would be a shame if you and your college buddies went missing, wouldn't it? I then did as he said and uncovered my webcam. He then told me to follow his instructions on how to make it impossible for me to reach the site again. I followed each and every one. When I finished, I got a text that said, now don't even try and come back. Just like before, it had no number. I still called the police for my friend's phone, but they were never able to find the site. If you ever go into the deep web, don't just mindlessly explore, especially if you don't have additional software to keep you more secure. I was a stupid college kid, and I just hope nobody makes the same mistakes I did. I remember when I was about 14, I heard what the deep web was, but I never actually went on to it. From my understanding, you could basically buy drugs and weapons, things like that. But what I actually saw was a lot more evil and twisted than I could even imagine. This one time, when we were in computer science class at school, we often got bored and dicked around. One day we were talking about the deep web, and a few of my friends decided to look into how to actually get onto the deep web. When we got on there, we saw the usual things that I expected, like drugs, weapons, things like that. But the most disturbing sight we found was a comprehensive guide for how to cook women. Now, we're not talking about a short joke here. This page actually had information on what body types to use for specific cuts, how to prepare these cuts, and even worse, how to cook the girl so she lives as long as possible. After we saw that, we came straight off it. We were too scared to even look any further as to what else we could find. And to this day, I've never been back on the deep web again. I stumbled upon the folder unintentionally. My Communications 101 professor insisted we use a search engine to find out what others could find out about us in just minutes using the internet. We would copy our findings into a document and turn it in as an assignment. So, at home, googling my name, I searched through the normal things until the fourth page resulted in the bold blue hyperlink. Torrent file. My videos. And under it, the descriptive text read, www. 
FileTorrents.com Index 100 plus items A private tracker and torrent club Featuring verified torrents And so on And then The name of a movie and There it was My Name In bold Under the torrent link I read it over a few times. A video file from 2008, available for download. I know, I'd never shot a video of myself. I'd never even been recorded with my friends or family that I know of. Never uploaded anything online with a video format, or even had it on my computer. I clicked it, thinking it surely must be another person. Coincidentally with my name. A video of them, or just a very over-tagged website. Any one of many common explanations. It redirected me to a one-purpose domain name, with nothing to link to but a downloadable folder containing .raw clips. My curiosity was far greater than my fear of a virus, so I began the download. As it downloaded and processed, I scrolled to the bottom of the page. A small bar of information denoted the author. Lab underscore Inuk. The last update. Yesterday, 2pm EST. And the year of the website's first published online time. 1997. It was obviously an old website. But was still kept updated. The download finished. And opened in front of my web browser nestled in the download section of my computer. Name simply, New Folder. I opened it to reveal dozens of folders containing dozens of raw clips, each labelled with a year. 1997, 98, 99, all the way to 2012. At this point I was driven purely by curiosity. But I was unsuspicious of what these videos were about. I didn't expect anything malicious. Well, maybe a web diary. In the first folder, 1997. The first clip, 11 97 Opened to the view of a neighborhood street from the window of a driver's side door. Pleasant enough. Someone was recording as they drove past the houses of a lower-income-looking residential area. You could see the steering wheel and the interior of the car in the poor, older-quality video. The driver was slow through the neighborhood, like a mailman or ice cream truck, stopping occasionally at houses for brief moments. This could be anything from reality video, a camera test, an event file. At this point, the turns he made and houses he passed began to look familiar. I thought nothing of it until he slowed at a house I knew I recognized. I froze. The camera zoomed in on a child playing in the leaves on a lawn. I can still remember all too clearly. It was me. Or at least, it had to be me. That was my yard, in front of the house I grew up in, in the neighborhood I knew looked familiar. It was me playing in the rake leaves my father gathered and left near the curb in November of 1997. And this person had a video of it. I exited out of the video leaving the other 17 minutes and 40 seconds unwatched, and went back to the previous folder. There was a whole screen of videos from 1997. <sighs> My head raced, mentally searching through all the folders named a certain year. Were they all videos of me? Dozens, well, hundreds of clips of me? What were all these videos of? What am I doing in all of them? When I found the link, it really had been my name, and not some mistake. 
That was me at my old house in 1997. Oh, dear God, there are more. 98, 99. The website had updated yesterday. What the folder? 2012. Not only does this person have a video of me as a child, but they have some of me this year. Of me... yesterday. Oh God. And I never even knew. I frantically clicked on a year and played one of the videos. Me. Older now. Outside of school. Getting dropped off and going into the building. I opened another without closing the previous one. In this clip, I'm at a friend's house. This is a view from a window, and we're cooking something on the stove. I open another. I'm on my bed, reading a book. The camera is in my bedroom doorway in my house. Another. I'm at a loud restaurant, ordering food at a table of friends. Another. I'm having sex in my college dorm. Another. I'm at the beach on vacation, far from home. I'm brushing my teeth. I'm asleep at my desk. I'm at the doctor. I, I, I'm opening my door. A man is cutting open a woman strapped to a table. Back to the camera. The knife clean cutting the side of the woman from her bare breast to her ankle, her eyes following the blade, and the blood oozing from the cleaved flesh. And, as she watches the man, eyes wide and horrified, he slices a piece of her calf off and lifts it to his face. I notice she looks similar to me. The web browser deep beneath all the videos and open folders begins to bling repeatedly. All I have open in my browser is the website the videos came from. Panicky, unable to take even breaths, hands violently uneasy and weak, stomach sick and churning, mind dizzy, I close all the open files. The website's pings grow louder. The beeps pulsating in my ears like my heartbeat. I stare at the new link under the downloadable videos. New live stream. My face contorted into a clenched, scared grimace. I watch the video expand on my screen. And I see the back of my head and the infinite cycle of me watching myself on a computer. Without turning my head, my eyes dart around the room on the video screen. A shadow plays on the wall, and in the reflection on the glossy surface of my computer. I feel a hand play with my hair, and I exit the video. This is a story from a supposed surgeon living in Eastern Europe. He sells something very peculiar on the deep web. His product is living sex dolls. They sell for about $40,000 plus shipping. He states that he's a prominent surgeon living in a poverty stricken Eastern European country. He makes donations to a local orphanage and adopts several young girls from ages six or so to early teens. The orphanage is glad to be rid of the extra mouths to feed and happy to accept his donations so they don't ask any questions. He takes these girls home and begins a horrible non-human transformation for a sick and evil purpose. He turns them into sex slaves. He describes his methods for doing this in demented detail. Firstly, he removes all four limbs of the girls in one surgery. 
leaving only stumps, which he fastened to steel rod for chaining them, or as he suggests, hanging them from the ceiling as a decoration. The girls are fed from a bottle, and only the minimum amount to keep them alive. He says they are extremely easy to care for. They have to eat from a bottle, because all of their teeth have also been removed. He then places a rubber insert into their mouth. For what he says, to maintain beauty, and to assist with fellatio. The girls are then tortured physically and mentally to turn them into unfeeling slaves. They undergo the worst kind of torture imaginable. He electrocutes and slices their genitals, cuts them, beats them with almost anything you can think of, whips them mercilessly, squeezes their body parts with pliers, and that's just to start to describe the sick and sadistic things he does to these poor little girls. The doctor destroys their hearing by playing extremely loud music and sounds from headphones. He then uses a laser to mostly blind the girls. All the while, he performs any sexual act you can imagine on them to prepare them for their new owner. He tortures them for months before they are finally ready to be sold. I've been using the dark web for quite some time now. My favourite thing to go onto is something called Silk Road. I was buying some illegal substances off Silk Road for a while when one day I received an inbox message on my personal Twitter account. The person talked about how I was an amateur and I obviously didn't know how to protect my identity enough and that they will report me to the police with information about what types of substances I was buying. When I initially called their bluff, they went on to say things like, Oh really? I'm old Carolyn Stevens here. Oh, how about Mr. Jones from your school? Now this really freaked me out because, well, how would he know the names of my parents and my school teacher? He was demanding money in return for not giving me up to the police. I was basically being blackmailed and I was very nervous because this person had all my info and I thought my Tor browser had been compromised. Later on I rationalised that I was following the Is Silk Road up and running Twitter account on my personal Twitter. The person assumed what I was using it for and used my real Twitter name to find out information on me and blackmail me. It ended up just blowing over after I ignored and blocked the account. But it opened my eyes though, and it was a pretty scary moment. It's kind of put me off going on Silk Road and the deep web to be honest with you. It was too much of a close call. 